Hey guys, it's Chris, and welcome to my yard. In today's video, I teamed up with Eric from Life and Farmland to talk about three different things when preparing for the wood burning season. Um, we're going to talk about splitting your firewood, we're going to talk about maintenance on your chimney, and we're also going to talk about the differences in storing wood. I have limited space, he has a lot more space. So I hope you enjoy this video. So when I'm splitting firewood, I like to do it with my splitter standing up vertically and the reason for that is I find it easier to bring the piece on the ground and roll it to it or uh, if it's something that's extra heavy set it in there standing up. So I personally prefer to work with my splitter more in the horizontal position unless I'm working with some fairly large rounds. Uh, I found it a lot easier on my knees and my back and if I set things up right I can pull the wood right off the trailer without hardly have to bend over, get it split and then right onto the wood pile. So when I'm cleaning my chimney, I use a steel brush that mine is actually 8 inch square, so I have an 8 inch square brush. You can get round brushes, 9 inch, 10 inch, whatever the size of your um, flue is. Now I picked them up for about $15 and my rods are about $7, $8. I did get them at a surplus store, so you can purchase them probably roughly about $10 a piece at Lowe's or Home Depot. So unlike Chris, when we moved into our place, we didn't have a mason chimney at all and uh, we ended up going with one of these pre-manufactured chimneys. These are pretty nice. This is a double wall stainless steel. You do have to be a little careful when it comes time to clean these though. You don't want to use a wire brush to do this. You want to use a poly brush. The nice part about us actually having it on the outside of a house like this is it makes it very easy. We run a brush up and down our chimney way more than we need to, probably once a month because it takes us about five minutes. We can brush it all from the ground and then somewhere during the winter when the snow finally melts off the side of the roof here, um, I'll get up there climbing, just inspect the chimney cap just to make sure everything's going. But that generally is the place that most people seem to struggle with creosote issues. It's actually on the chimney cap itself. If you have a screen on there, that tends to be the area that clogs and then you don't get a decent draft that comes up and you can tend to get smoke pouring into your house. Depending on the brush head you get, sometimes they'll have a loop on one side that allows you to tie a rope to it so that you can drop that rope down, pull the, the brush through. Uh, a lot of times they also have a threaded in there so you can put it on some sort of flexible rod and run it up and down. If you have someone come out and professionally do it, a lot of times they'll do a little bit of extra service. So it might be a good idea to have someone professionally do it every 10 years or 5 years. I'm not sure what the recommendation is on that. But a lot of times they'll come out with a camera and run it up and down just to make sure everything's looking good inside your chimney. Especially if you have a mason chimney. I know some of the bricks and stuff can start crumbling on the inside. And it's just an extra reassurance. So wood heat is a pretty dry heat. That's part of the reason a lot of times you have to run a humidifier during the winter. And we've noticed a pretty big improvement if we bring our wood in about a week or two before it ends up in the stove. It helps dry it out just a little bit more. So we try to keep a two to three week worth of wood supply down in our basement. We also keep an additional stash out in our garage. Uh, part of the reason for that is if we end up getting some big snowstorm or something like that, it takes the pressure off and have to get trails open up to go get our uh, supply that's out in our pole barn. You do want to be a little cautious though. You uh, because if you bring too much wood in, you can degrade the air quality of your house. So you can see space isn't really an issue for us. We keep a two to three year wood supply. Whatever we're going to burn for the up and coming winter, we end up putting in our pole barn. It's kind of our wood shed, I guess you could call it, uh, to help keep it protected. We do have to do a little bit of thinking with our layout out here. That way we can still get farm equipment out here to do this hay field, as well as uh, when it comes time to cut the grass, I wanna get off and have to weed whip as little as possible. So trying to limit a lot of the, the turns that are in there and still being able to make it accessible where we can just pull up, load up the trailer and take off. So because of my limited space I have here at the house, my way of storing wood is somewhat limited. I can basically store about two years worth of the load but I can't go with like a five year plan of trying to get that much wood. I just don't have the space. When it's time for me to bring the firewood in, I usually will set my firewood here and in a room back behind here. Between these two spaces, I have about a third of a cord that I can bring in. And that lasts me for about a week or if it gets really cold and we're consistently spurning a lot of wood, Probably about four days and I got to load in more wood and also anytime I'm going outside I'll try to bring in a load with my arm or just something so I'm not wasting 
a lot of effort coming in with absolutely nothing in my hand, especially when I'm walking right by the firewood. So sometimes you're all cutting firewood and you end up with some just real odd shaped pieces. Uh, maybe you have to trim things up and you end up with these little cutoffs. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll stuff those in one of these whole housings uh, where it doesn't make sense to put in a more of a traditional stacking method where you end up with an unstable pile. I'm curious what you do with your ends, Chris. So when I end up with pieces that are cut off from uh, cutting down a tree or splitting, I'll throw them into a box that I made that's specifically for kindling and for these odd pieces. And to see how this all works, you can check out my video that shows how to build one of these. Hey, so I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked what you saw, please be sure to go follow Eric on his channel, Life in Farmland. The link is going to be in the description below and right here in the corner. So uh, please check him out, subscribe to his channel, and check out all his videos. He's got some really cool videos. And uh, while you're there, say hi. Um, be sure to subscribe to my channel, follow me on Facebook and Instagram. And thanks for watching.